Hello all, this is Kathy. I'd like to show you some slides, some paintings, in preparation for your directly painted self-portrait assignment. Now, I'm going to start off with some indirectly painted paintings, some uh, paintings that were definitely created working over underpaintings, and that might seem odd, but the reason is I think it's a little hard to understand the um, impact of direct painting, the possibilities of it, uh, until you compare it with what went before, with um, the centuries of, of painting over underpainting. Very, very beautiful paintings were created this way. Uh, I would say Titian, who you see in this self-portrait here, is well, one of the first artists that people would think of in terms of working over an underpainting, although many others came before him. But he uh, really developed the use of many, many layers of super thin oil glazes mixed with uh, with linseed oil and varnish to create very tough layers of, of translucent color. So he would work over a fairly bravura sort of uh, warm underpainting. And you can see that if you look, for example, at the folds in the cloth here, he's kept the torso, the clothing, so dark that it almost melts into his background. But you can see uh, from the underpainting those big uh, kind of lightning bolts of, of loose uh, light paint that he has glazed and glazed and glazed over. Um, I love this composition. So simple, an exquisite focus on the face, but then this uh, hand, almost like a little pile of, of lit kindling in the bottom of the painting, like a, um, a little warm spot that uh, very loosely painted, but takes our eyes down there. I hope you get to see a Titian in real life someday because a slide just cannot convey the, um, the warmth and depth that this underpainting technique gives with the many layers of glaze over it. Underpainting was also used by Artemisia Gentileschi, and in fact she um, often saved uh, copies of her underpainting so that she could use them as to start various different commissions. And here you see a self-portrait as the allegory of painting. So these paintings, although they are created over underpaintings, are similar to what you're doing in the fact that they are self-portraits. This, to me, is one of the world's great paintings, Velázquez's portrait of his studio assistant, Juan de Pareja. And this is obviously not a self-portrait, but I think in terms of the, uh, well, the mastery of drawing, the amazing reserved mastery of color here, the very, very simple but, but so powerful composition. Uh, you see the slight gradient in the negative shape and the dramatic uh, light and, and shadow in the collar, uh, the beautiful straightforward gaze of the model. Um, I just don't think painting gets any better than this. And Velazquez would have worked over an underpainting at that time that was the standard process for painters. I have a couple of Gainsboroughs here that I think might be interesting because in these, although these are not, again, not self-portraits, they are portraits of uh, children in his family, his two daughters, and I'll show you his nephew next. So they're very loose and tender, uh, much better, I think, than, than many of Gainsborough's more commercial paintings of aristocrats. Anyway, the um, the a beautiful, very loose underpainting, pretty much like a drawing in paint, is completely revealed here at the bottom. And you can see as you work your way up the painting how he just took a little bit of light paint here in these areas and kind of added it to the underpainting very much as if you were working with chalk on brown paper, right? Just giving a little bit more light tone to these areas here in the chest around the collarbones, the neck, you see the, the light paint gets a little bit thicker and thicker. And then as you get up to the face, the faces are really modeled very sculpturally with, with light and shade. You see these uh, a nice little secondary highlights, a little bit of of warm color here being bounced up from her sister's face below. Uh, very, very beautiful. And then of course in the sky, he has added um, some quite thick paint that really makes me feel that to him, this was a finished painting. You could make a case that he just abandoned it at this point and didn't quite finish it. Certainly if this had been one of his commercial commissions, he would not have left it in this condition. But, but to me, it seems perfect. And I have to wonder if he didn't think that this was just exactly the right light 
touch for this uh, lovely double portrait of his daughters. We have, I have a close-up here of this portrait of his nephew. And here again, you can see the underpainting, which is kind of like a, a drawing in paint, really, showing through here in the shadowed areas. And it looks to me as if Gainsborough left quite a bit of this sort of sienna underpainting to indicate the darker uh, shadows. And you see it shining through even here in some of the um, darker areas of the face and achieved most of his value contrast by adding a light paint to the underpainting. Very, very thin, very delicate. If you're going to use an underpainting to paint over in this way and to add color to it, it is probably best to keep that underpainting very thin so the lumps and so forth don't present obstacles to you as you add color. So that's um, working over an underpainting. Along about the middle 1800s, somebody invented metal paint tubes. And artists, even if they made their own paint, which was quite common, I mean, that would have been the standard thing to do in, in that period, uh, they could put it into these tubes. I've done that myself. I've mixed up some colors that I want to use exactly as they are, and I have loaded them into metal paint tubes, which you can buy uh, commercially still with little caps on the end. You seal up the bottom with a pair of pliers. Then you can uncap your paint and uh, take it out with you into the woods. And, and landscape painters, I believe, were the first uh, people to take advantage of this ability to go and work on site directly with whatever colors they intended the painting finally to convey. But it didn't take long for people to realize that this way of direct painting was actually a very exciting way to paint. And Edward Manet um, worked uh, quite directly with his paint. And once artists started doing this, you see a lot more of the kind of brushwork that really reminds you of the gesture of the artist's hand. So I particularly love, uh, speaking of the artist's hand, this hand here, which is blocked in so quickly. And you can almost feel how fast he made those strokes. It makes you feel that his hand is actually moving. And it was, because he was looking at himself in a mirror, almost certainly, as he painted this and holding that brush in his hand, that very brush. Van Gogh, of course, did many, many self-portraits and took many, many different approaches in how he composed the rectangle. And this is one of the things I'd really like you to bring away from looking at these slides. It is very, very challenging, I think, to compose a human face and possibly torso, right, uh, on a rectangle because there is nothing more interesting than a human being. And what do you do with the rest of the rectangle, right? What can you possibly do with it to make it a living, breathing part of the painting? Well, in this case, uh, Van Gogh was inspired to use some of the similar strokes and colors that he had used in his own clothing to simply create a pattern in the rectangle, which I feel has a lot of expressive impact for me. If I try to do a thought experiment and replace that pattern with something much flatter or uh, less articulated, I feel like a lot of the emotional impact is lost. We're looking at a face and a figure that seem almost withdrawn and reserved, right? There isn't a lot of real violent emotion evident in the face and figure, and I almost feel that some of that emotion is coming out in the way the rectangle has been filled with these swirls of paint. This is another Van Gogh self-portrait. This is um, apparently after he famously cut off his ear. You see that aspect of his face very, very realistically and straightforwardly rendered, and you also see exactly what I presume he saw behind him in the studio. It looks like a Japanese print that he may have had, a woodblock print that he may have had on his wall. You see at the corner of his door, you see another easel with a painting behind it, you see the coat he happened to be wearing. It really looks as if this is a bit of a slice of life. He's just telling us exactly how it felt to be him that day in the place where he was. To me, this is another way of making a, a very moving psychological self-portrait. I'd like you to observe color in his face. I'm not sure if you would have noticed that because there are so many kind of uh, bright popping colors in this painting, but many of the colors that you see in the wall, for example, um, in the easel, in the coat, have been used 
to actually paint the face, right? I see some uh, bright pinks in the face that I don't see anywhere else. But you can really see him cutting loose from the fact that you might need to render a specific local color, right? He's, uh, he's using color much more expressively here. This beautiful self-portrait while pregnant by Paula Modersohn Becker is to me a much more serene and uh, almost complacent self-portrait. She uses that gold background to uh, almost make her figure glow. You feel as if the way that she lets the values of her shoulders and her uh, arm on the right side in particular meld with the value of the gold in the background it makes it feel that she is almost glowing with an air light and, and imparting that light to the negative shape of the painting. I think although the negative shape is fairly simple, it doesn't depict anything except this repeated stroke of the background, but that seems very important and I feel that if that negative shape were not there or if it were different, much of the impact of the painting would be lost or at least change. And that's what we want to do. We want to use everything else around the portrait in the rectangle to reinforce, to elaborate on the expression that you're creating in the portrait itself. I'm going to show you three portraits by Sir Stanley Spencer. If you've been in my drawing classes, you will have seen these before, but it won't hurt you to look at them again. I love this uh, painter's work, and these portraits are also different from each other. Uh, really, really nice uh, sort of a, a walk through an artist's life. This self-portrait was done when he was, let's see, it would have been, I'm doing the math here, I think it looks like 22 years old, maybe 23 years old, quite young, uh, maybe about the age of some of you. And you'll see that he is integrating the negative shape into his self-portrait by letting the two almost melt together. Here on the right side, you can see just a teeny little bit of, an, of a place where the, the side of the jaw and the uh, neck, and then of course the ear, catch the light. The hair almost completely blends in to the negative shape. And that's fine. I don't think anybody has any trouble recognizing that that's a human head and whose head it is, if you know what Sir Stanley Spencer looks like. To let those contours be lost and then found again can be a very, very satisfying um, experience for the viewer. And of course, in this case, yields a beautifully dramatic uh, self-portrait. Here's a self-portrait uh, a little bit later. He would have been in his 40s, it looks like, at this, at this uh, point. Here you see, same guy, um, a little bit of a freer attitude, again, towards the color in his face. This reminds me of of Van Gogh a little bit. Remember those bright strokes of pink and green in his face? And uh, here Spencer has not um, held back at all in using any color that he feels like to paint his face. Uh, although in some ways this portrait is quite realistic because you see behind him probably what he saw looking at his studio window, right? There's a landscape there. He's, he's painted in somewhat faded colors to give us a feeling of its distance, I think. But uh, he's simply giving us, again, a, a sort of a slice of life, what it felt like to be him working in his studio on this day in his life. The hands are such an expressive and important part of the painting. And, uh, and again, uh, like that uh, hand in the Manet self-portrait that we looked at earlier, you feel, although these are painted much more specifically and exactly, you know, you feel their motion and their energy as being a really important part of this self-depiction. And here is one of uh, Spencer's late self-portraits when he would have been in his 60s. Again, it has that same uh, forthright honesty, just looking straight at himself and therefore straight at us, as he, as he did in both of the other two paintings. You feel himself looking at himself in the mirror. This time, notice the asymmetry that he sees and, uh, and how he isn't afraid to depict that. That happens as you get older. I've seen it happen as I work on self-portraits myself. And you see it particularly in the eyes. You see it in the chin quite a bit. And interestingly, you see it in the way he depicts that background, right? Like Modersohn Becker, he has chosen basically to fill his background with tiny dots. Right, to, get, to, to enliven it with this repeated mark, 
we feel that it's probably the wallpaper that he saw behind him in the room where he was painting. He's made the dots closer and closer and closer together as you move to the left to give us a feeling of the depth of the room, that you're moving back into space. But he's done it in such a playful, uh, unsystematic way that although we get that feeling of depth, we get we get a feeling of distortion too, very powerfully, as if there's a little bit of a, of a whoop to do in the mirror, so that we feel that not only is his face becoming less symmetrical, but his view of the world is perhaps not as symmetrical as it once was. I may be pushing the metaphor there, but I, but I do think that that freedom to let the pattern uh, dissolve and warp there on the left side is one of the really delightful things about this painting and about the feeling of psychological lightness. I'll show you a couple of portraits by, uh, by Thomas Hart Benton. Again, he, uh, these are self-portraits. Uh, one when he was very young and uh, surrounded by other beautiful young forms and the, the clouds behind him, the low vantage point, the fact that he's looking so buff and is showing us all the uh, light and shadows on his muscles and so forth. It's a bit of a um, godlike celebration of himself, I feel. It's a proud and cocky self-portrait and speaks of his uh, youthful confidence, uh, to put it mildly. I, I do feel that the figures around him and the landscape around him are important to the self-portrait and help us to um, understand the world that he felt he moved in and its importance to him. Here's a self-portrait that he did. Let's see, 1889 he was born. So this one would have been, he'd been 81 years old when he painted this one. Oh man, I still hope I'm working this beautifully when I'm 81 years old. But here he is maybe just as cocky, but uh, perhaps uh, even more honest and authentic about his life, um, what's important to him, what he looks like, not afraid to show us the signs of his age, but again, just a uh, remarkably uh, confident and uh, straightforward assessment of himself. We're not seeing any sculptural clouds, any uh, beautiful young women uh, draped around him, anything like that. We're, we're just seeing what is important to him, what is important to him to show. I hope you'll think about that as you're designing your own self-portrait. Uh, Frida Kahlo, of course, painted many subjects, but she is most famous probably for her self-portraits, and many of them include animals, insects. Uh, this thorn necklace is a good example of the kind of symbolic things that she often put into her self-portraits to try to tell us in fairly direct symbolic language what was going on in her life and what it felt like to be her. Uh, don't be afraid to include things in your self-portrait that you can't observe directly that might lead a viewer to understand you or to feel what it's like to be you in a pictorial way beyond words. Uh, here's a sort of a, a cerebral self-portrait by Tom Phillips, and you see that this self-portrait has been painted on top of a literal page from a um, printed book, and he has concealed the letters that he doesn't need, although he's let a lot of them show through his face. He has revealed words that he feels apparently has something uh, to do with telling us who he is and what it feels like to be a humanist at the age of 50. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure the medium here, but I am going to guess that this may be done in egg tempera because of the cross-hatching um, effect here and, and because that is a medium that works very well on paper. This could have been done in acrylics too though. A wonderful cross-hatching technique which allows that layer underneath to show through. You might consider painting your self-portrait, especially if you're working with acrylics, on a support that already gives you something to respond to. A page from a book, like Phillips did, a map, a poster, or, or something that already has an image on it that you can incorporate, conceal, integrate into your likeness. And I'm going to end with a couple of paintings by one of my favorite uh, portrait painters, Alice Neal. This first one, of course, is not a self-portrait. Um, it's a, uh, one of my favorites of her paintings, a uh, painting of these 
two young boys both looking at us, you feel that she must have seen them sitting in this chair and asked them to pose and worked so quickly or maybe brought them to her studio and let them sit around until she found them in a place where she thought uh, the pose would work. She painted it, I think, so quickly that they were able to maintain this very relaxed feeling of momentary stasis when you know that boys this age would not sit still for very long. Look at the way the hands are painted. Look at the way the clothing is painted. She clearly feels that those hands are a really important part of the lightness and that the way they wear their clothes is an important part of the lightness, but she has not labored over those things. She's painted them just as fast as she could, you feel. You know, we feel the tones in the background there were just slapped in as fast as she could, probably because she was working from life for the very short time that these uh, boys were gonna be able to sit for her. Of course, Neil painted the human figure for decades, and part of the reason she was able to work so quickly was her mastery of, of drawing and painting. But I also think that part of the beauty of her paintings is the energy we feel because of her quick work. So it's which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? But uh, a real, uh, really inspiring composition. Very, very simple treatment of the negative shapes, but just perfect to enhance uh, and frame these faces. If you notice around the eyes and, and in the uh, lips, just a little flecks everywhere in the hands and so forth, you'll see some of the same colors that she used in the negative shapes. Some of those pinks, some of those browns, especially reddish browns, some of those greens, you'll see them in the, um, in the faces too. And that's how she kind of ties the positive shapes and negative shapes together into a unified whole. And finally, I want to show you her uh, very famous <laughs> self-portrait when she was 80 years old, a few years before her death. And again, here, this goes Thomas Hart Benton one better, I think, in her complete uh, authenticity. She enjoys the shapes and colors uh, that she finds in her 80-year-old flesh. And, uh, and that is not an easy thing to do, right? If you, you know, as you age and watch your flesh change from youth to age, it can be very, very difficult to see the um, beauty and the interest in those changes. And uh, I just, I love this painting for that reason. I think the honesty of it, the vulnerability of it, and... Uh, just the, the gorgeous sense of, of fun here. Make this uh, a, a great painting for me. Look how she repaints and redraws the back of the chair. And she kind of subsumes those extra lines into the shadow that she's casting on the wall, but not carefully. I mean, she doesn't care whether you think she made a mistake or whether you see that she changed her mind about where that contour is. She doesn't care about much of anything <laughs> except looking, looking, looking in the mirror. And uh, we see her looking right at us uh, because we were where the mirror would be. And it's uh, a very riveting gaze. Paint with courage. Have fun. You know she had fun doing this. I look forward to seeing you soon.